All right, cool. Well, thank you again for joining us, Fred. Um, I guess if you wouldn't mind for for the folks on the call, you know, quickly quickly introducing yourself uh, again in case in case people uh, sure. um, are less up to date. And then yeah, we're, we're we're super excited to go through some of these notes today. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Vince. Yeah, so I'm Fred. Um, I was in Chris's lab at Stanford as a postdoc for a while, which is how I've met all these folks and worked on weak supervision and snorkel, um, but more on the academic side of the papers. But I also was at the company for like five or six months um, back last year at the end of the year. Currently, I'm a professor at Wisconsin, um, which I guess, yeah, various people are also connected to. Chris was also a professor there in the past. I, I do like this area, like weak supervision a lot. Um, and yeah, I get pretty excited by label model stuff. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. Does that sound good? Vince, I don't know what the uh, official format for reading group is, but I have some slides. Yeah, that sounds, hopefully gonna that be sounds okay. perfect. Yeah, cool. and I'm sure um, people will will probably uh, you know speak up about questions and things like that. Um, whatever works for you, honestly, Fred, it, given you've yeah, done no. this in the past. Please ask questions. That's going to be the easiest thing to do, just so I'm not talking, you know, completely randomly about stuff. Um, and I'm trying to make this as user friendly as possible. So if stuff is getting confusing, just let me know, ask me questions. Sound good? Cool. Yeah, Vince, if you want to record this, that's perfectly okay. Awesome. Okay. I think we're, I think we're recording. So we're good to go. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, I figured we'd do kind of a, a quick presentation on trying to understand the label model and sort of what it's really trying to do so that when you guys check out like the code, you can make sense of it and like what's actually happening there. Um, and I'll try to make this as intuitive as possible. There's some math, but hopefully it's not like really bad math. Um, if I'm going to low level, let me know and we'll explain things. If I'm going too high level, also let me know and we'll, we'll talk, I don't know, more technically about stuff. Um, all right, so this thing you've probably seen before, right? This is our traditional snorkel weak supervision pipeline. I guess currently snorkel actually does a lot more than this, but this was sort of the, the original vision. Um, you have the users that write the labeling functions, which can be roughly anything then these labeling functions get applied to some unlabeled data point and they all provide some conflicting and probably noisy guesses of what an unlabeled data point should be right so then we try to figure out how to model the labeling functions so how to know which ones are reliable which ones are not reliable which ones i should sort of kind of throw out or not throw out or what to do with them basically and by doing that, we can figure out sort of the best guess of what the actual label should be. And that provides us with this automatically constructed data set. Um, and then we train some end model on that. So this is the, the standard picture. And we're going to talk pretty much entirely about this second phase, um, the label model itself. OK, so what's the intuition behind what we're doing for the label model? Um, the, sort of picture I always come up with is that you're in a courtroom, right? Because we always talk about the, the true label for a data point as being this latent, unobserved variable. And that's exactly what happens in court, right? Like, you don't know whether the person who's accused of a crime actually committed the crime or not. If you were confident, if you already knew, you wouldn't really need a court procedure. But you don't really know, right? You have to use some alternative forms of information to try to guess um, what the case is there. Okay, so this is the courtroom. And the thing that we get information from are these witnesses, right? Um, and each witness will say, I think the person who's accused committed the crime or not, right? Okay, in practice, it's a bit more complicated than that, but let's go with this really simplified analogy, right? So these witnesses are kind of like our labeling functions. Um, this variable of whether it was a crime or not is kind of like a plus one, minus one label for our case, right? Um, and then, you know, one witness says plus one, one witness says plus one, one witness says minus one, or whatever. So the easiest thing to do is to then say, okay, well, let's look at what the majority of the witnesses say, right? Um, if they say that there was a crime, let's go with that. If they say there was no crime, then let's just also go with that, right? That's kind of the, the standard thing to do. And this is exactly what the majority vote 
sort of aspect of the label model is also doing. It literally says, okay, the majority of the labeling function said plus one, let me say this data point's a plus one. If the majority said minus one, then it's a minus one. So this is a really simple case. Still really useful, actually. You can get a lot from doing this, but there's some downsides, right? So one downside is that all these guys are not equally reliable, right? So there are some witnesses that are really reliable. You can trust them. If they say there was a crime, then there probably was one, right? So like this first one here, the other ones may not be as reliable, right? Maybe they don't give you that much information. So you don't wanna throw out the witnesses that are not as reliable, but you do wanna find out a way to kind of weight them differently, right? You wanna trust the reliable ones more than the unreliable ones. But the hard part is that you don't know for sure, you know, who's reliable and who's unreliable. That information doesn't come to us. We have to figure it out on our own. So that's one thing. We call this accuracies, right? We want our label model to incorporate the accuracies of the labeling function. Then the second thing is, you know, imagine if three of the witnesses kind of cooperated and talked together before we went to court, right? Um, if they kind of got their stories straight together, you wouldn't really trust them as much as three separate independent people, right? Because maybe, you know, they had different views, but once they coordinated, they've kind of come to agreement on one view. So this is this problem of correlations or cliques. You'd like to be able to downweight people that sort of have gotten their story straight beforehand. Um, so yeah, these are the two things that we really want our label model to kind of include over majority vote, right? Majority vote doesn't know how to deal with any of these problems. It gives equal weight to everybody, reliable or unreliable. Um, and it gives equal weight to everybody, even if they form the clique and you know discuss in advance or whatever the analogy is here. So we wanna kind of include these two things in our label model, which means we'll have to learn about these accuracies and these correlations. Okay, um, I promise I won't have any more silly analogies or images from this point on. So let's get into the kind of actual modeling for these things. Um, the math for it is this notation, lambda one, lambda two through lambda n. These are the labeling functions. They're random variables. So they're these things that take on values like minus one or plus one. And then of course there's this true but unobserved label y, right? And we don't get to see it, but it's, it's there. So what's our actual goal in this case? Like very concretely, we wanna compute this probability P of Y given lambda one, lambda two through lambda M. So this is a conditional probability. It's the probability of the label having known that we have this information from the labeling functions. So you can read it as saying, what's the probability given all of the guesses that we've seen that Y has value zero or one or two or whatever. So this is already much nicer than like the majority vote because we don't have to just say, oh yeah, I think it's plus one. I can say, yeah, I think it's a probability of 0 0.6 of being plus one and 0 0.3 of being minus one and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a lot more useful information that you can give to your model when you're training instead of just saying, yeah, has to be a plus one because the majority of the people said this here. Okay, so we wanna compute this conditional probability. The hard part is we have to know enough information to be able to actually compute it. And the way we're gonna do that is by encoding all of that information into this model that we call the label model. So that's all the label model really is. It's all of the information that we need to compute these conditional probabilities that tell us, given what the labeling functions output, what do we think is the probability of every possible value of the true label? Does this make sense? Does everyone sort of happy with this formulation? And nothing, we haven't really done anything yet here, right? We're just sort of defining what the problem is and where we're trying to go. Okay, before we go any further, you know, what's a model? Um, all we mean here is that it's a set of parameters that can fully specify some distribution that you can then use for calculations. So I wanna be able to compute this conditional probability. So I need a model that gives me enough information to compute that, and that's it. There's a lot of different usages of model in snorkel. So, you know, we have to distinguish between the different ones here. So a really, really simple example, right? A Gaussian random variable, you can think of it as a model just by itself. If you know the mean and if you know the variance, that's all you need to know about it. 
it completely specifies the entire distribution for a Gaussian. Right, so if I tell you the mean and the variance, you can say, oh yeah, the probability of X equals 3.7 is this much. Um, the probability that X is between minus two and 16 is this much and so on. You know all the information to compute stuff like that. So for our label model, we wanna define kind of similar things, right? We wanna find what are the parameters that are gonna be enough for us to compute these conditional probabilities for the true label. Right, so you know, here's the classic image of the bell curve. The mean is the thing in the middle. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. You know, it's like 60, whatever, 8% off or whatever it is for, for this kind of thing. All right, so that's the model idea. I'm already talking about random variables, so let me briefly remind you of some of the notation. I'm trying to stay away from any really deep math, but you know, we'll need this part, unfortunately. So the mean is just kind of the average, that's this expectation of X. Um, the variance is this measure of the spread, you know, how far away you are from the mean on average. The really interesting one that we'll use a lot is this covariance between two variables. It's kind of a measure of how related two variables are. Um, so if variables are independent, which means they have no information about each other, their covariance is zero. So we'll use this quite a bit. You can already kind of think of this as defining an accuracy. Like we want to know the covariance between one labeling function and the true label, right? If a labeling function is really bad at guessing the true label, the covariance between these two things will be zero. Okay, and then finally, there's this independence property, which is the classic one that we always talk about. Um, a and B are independent if and only if P of AB is P of A times P of B. And this implies that the expectations for these two things, you can write the product as the product of the expectations. Um, nothing crazy going on, just basic probability stuff from, from back in any of these classes. All right, now we're gonna set up the model that actually is the label model itself, right? And again, this is just some parameters that specify the distribution that we're gonna use to compute this conditional probability. And it, it's gonna have to involve all of these variables the labeling functions in the true unobserved label. And then of course, we're gonna to have to learn these parameters from data, right? Because we don't know them a priori, right? So in this Gaussian case, for example, you could compute the mean by just taking a bunch of samples, adding them up and normalizing, right? Dividing by how many things you saw. So we're gonna to have to find a similar way to do stuff here as well, right? Oh, you can think of a coin flip in the same way, right? If you know that the probability of heads is P, you could estimate P by flipping a coin 10,000 times, you know, seeing how many heads there were and dividing by 10,000. That's an empirical estimate of P. We're gonna have to do a very similar thing for us too. Okay, so just recapping so far, we want to go beyond majority vote by integrating these kinds of accuracies of the labeling functions and possibly how correlated they are. To do this, we have to introduce some statistical model over the labeling functions in the true label. We're gonna have to figure out what are the appropriate parameters that encode all this information. We're gonna have to figure out a way to learn these parameters. And then we're gonna have to find, you know, what is the calculation that's gonna give us that conditional probability? You know, what is the probability of the true label given what we saw from the labeling functions? So that's the, the current game plan. Okay, so with this, we can actually write down the label model. You know, for each of the witnesses or whatever, we just have one of these nodes. Everything is written in this format of a graphical model. It's not super important yet, but it's a very convenient way for us to specify what these things look like. All right, there's one node for each labeling function. There's a node for the, the true label Y. We won't ever get to see Y. That's the whole idea behind weak supervision. We will see samples from the labeling functions. Um, that's the information we get to use. Now let's specify what these parameters actually are gonna be. Obviously we want things like the means, right? So the expectations of each of these um, labeling functions, lambda i. Also the expectation of y. So these things are easy-ish to estimate. Um, the expectation of lambda i is just, you know, look at all of the labeling function outputs for the ith labeling function. And then just see how often it votes one, how often it votes minus one, divide by the total, that gives you the mean, right? 
The expectation of Y is harder because you don't get to see the true labels, but you can sort of get this too if you have like a dev set, right? You just kind of get an estimate of the class balance from a dev set. And there's other ways to do this as well. So these are the means. And if you remember that Gaussian case, the means and the variances give you everything. It's going to be the same thing here as well. So the variances or covariances are going to be these accuracies and these correlations. Um, the expectation of lambda i times y, and then the expectations of this product lambda i times lambda j. Okay, so what's what's going on in these? So assume we're talking about binary variables here. So they're all either plus one or minus one. If your lambda i, your labeling function, is really accurate, then it's going to always agree with y. Right. So when y is 1, it's going to be 1. When y is minus 1, it's going to be minus 1. So this product will always be 1, right? Because 1 times 1 is 1. Um, and minus 1 times minus 1 is also 1, right? So this expectation is going to be close to 1 all the time. If they're really inaccurate, you're going to be like close to 0 all the time, right? So this kind of parameter will tell us how accurate the actual labeling functions are. And that's why we can justify this accuracy name. Correlations are the same things. You know, how often do labeling functions agree with each other, or how often do they disagree with each other? And, and that's actually all that's going on here on the left, basically. Each of these edges between a random variable and y is actually like one of these accuracy parameters. And then in the cases where there are these correlations, which was the whole labeling functions that are kind of cooperating together, um, you're going to get one correlation as well. So this gives you kind of all of the parameters of the model. Just like the Gaussians, you have these means, you have these covariance instead of variance. If you know these, it actually you have enough information to compute those conditional probabilities from before. So the goal for the label model is just to figure out these guys. If the label model can do that, then everything else kind of follows from here. OK, now the hard part, of course, is you know, it's very difficult to do this compared to the coin flip example for this special case here, the accuracies, right? Like normally, if I was computing this mean, I would say, let me get a bunch of samples and just kind of take their average, right? But I don't know what y is here. So I can't just take samples of lambda i times y. All right, that's the hard part about weak supervision. You don't know the true label, so you can't easily compute these kinds of empirical expectations. So that's the only real trick that we're going to have to kind of use here um, for the label model, a way to get access to this information you know, without actually knowing what y is. OK, so that's the whole setup. Label model is literally this system or distribution on the left, which has this kind of graphical representation. Nothing's happening here except having a bunch of parameters. We'd like to learn these parameters. If we know them, we can get a really good estimate of what the true label should be from the labeling functions. If we don't know these, we're stuck with majority vote, which may not be as precise as the label model's full sort of information. Let me take a quick break there. Um, does this stuff make sense? Is there anything confusing about what's going on so far? I'll pause so, for 30 seconds. Go for it. Fred, this is, this is assuming a binary classification where the outputs are negative one and one, right? Just the so yeah, I'm assuming that, but in practice, you could write a version of this for multi-class also. It would not be very different. The way you'd specify these parameters is slightly different instead. They'd be like vectors, but otherwise it's not really that different. You can also go and make them continuous variables too for the regressions up. It also looks pretty much like this. So really this thing's quite general. You can do almost anything with it. Uh, I have a couple quick questions. What is the yeah. mean used for? What is the, sorry? What's the, what are the means used for? Yeah, okay, that's a great question, right? So the means don't contain like magical information like the accuracy does where it's like, oh yeah, I know how to interpret what that means. The means are still important because you need them to compute the conditional probability in the end. They still specify the distribution. Um, you will not be able to compute P of Y given lambda one through lambda M unless you know the means. It's similar to like a, like a Gaussian. The variance tells you a lot of information, but if you're computing, you know, P of X is greater than two, you need to know that the mean is one, for example, or you'll be wrong. 
Yeah, so um, we're stuck. We still have to get the means. It's okay. Fortunately, those ones are, I guess, pretty easy. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. The the E of Y is the hard one. Oh, Unless yeah. you have a dev set, you can still do it. There's also a trick for that one. Uh, one other question is, in practice, it seems like we do often have a dev set uh, of ground truth. Why? Do we know in what cases it would be better to just like empirically sample the accuracies like lambda i y rather than like trying to learn them? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's Braden and Chile's favorite question, right? Um, yeah, so we actually wrote a whole paper about this subject um, with folks from Chris's lab, which is basically like what kind of ratio of label to unlabeled data you need to get more precision on computing the accuracy parameters. So we have kind of a, a trade-off for this. And we have this as one kind of label model in the code where you can use the ground truth to actually do the estimation just by empirically looking at E of lambda i y. And then it gets fancier. You can kind of combine the two, right? You can use the regular label model with this ground truth version in concert. So yeah, that's, that's an awesome question. We should talk about it at some point. Especially when dev sets are small, I think you're you're particularly prone to bias in terms of you know the three labeled examples of this class. Um, so it ends up being like that you often want to interpolate between the two, sort of like Fred said, where it's like I do want to use that information because I've got it, but I don't want to count everything on, especially in high cardinality or, or highly imbalanced cases. I think that's where it like matters especially. Um, the other comment you, you'll probably hit this, Fred, but just kind of for everyone's knowledge, you know, we're looking right now at refactoring, redesigning a little bit um, our label model structure to be make it easier to, to test out different um, different algorithms, different approaches, most of them developed by us, but even some good ideas if we see them in the wild, you know, we're happy to integrate those. But part of uh, thinking through that is, um, you know, this is the most basic setup where you just have the label matrix, but often we do have, practically speaking, other inputs, right? You may have information about a prior on the classes or some ground truth labels or you know, embeddings of the data points that you could also use. So there's, we're kind of in the process of collecting and I'm happy to share the doc um, for anyone. It's still pretty raw, but um, all of the things that a label, a, a theoretical label model could theoretically take advantage of and making sure that the pipes are there so that for any given label model, if you want access to that, if you have a way to use it, it can be provided. Yep, you can, you can think of what's going on on this slide as kind of like an interface, right? Basically, you want to use whatever information you have handy to compute these parameters, right? And then you're going to use them to do the inference problem, which is that conditional probability P of Y given the labeling functions. You know, how you do that, what information you use in there, you know, that's a separate question altogether. I'm going to show one really simple or two really simple examples, but you can go pretty far with different variations and different approaches. And quick question about what we currently do at Snorkel. So um, we have this conditional probability of why given the um, labeling functions, but do we use that or do we just get the training set label right now? Because every time I've used it, even from the SDK, I just use the label. I don't really use the probability in the final model. Um, yeah, yeah, we have a switch, right? That tells you that you can use one or the other. You can use probabilistic labels, um, in which case you'll have a vector of probabilities for each class. Um, and we do do that. I think might even be on that by will default. Be by default, I don't know. That's why. Oh, it's not selected by default, but it's there in the front end. Okay, thank you. Yeah, isn't there some checkbox on the train models page where you can hit it and and use it? Uh, I think it says use noise aware labels or something. It's not clear what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Thanks. The noise aware terminology is very classic. Uh, it comes from papers that came from other papers and so on. We should probably write down what that means somewhere. Quick question, I think I missed this, but wh where are we, you're assuming the LFs are returning like either a positive or a negative. What about the abstain vote? Or... Yeah, yeah, so they can also abstain, in which case you would say, you know, zero, right? So it's minus one, zero, or one. Got it. Or if you have higher classes, there's always one more value that the labeling functions can take compared to the why the label variable itself. Yeah, I'm actually gonna almost completely ignore abstains in this conversation because they add like one extra layer of technical complexity. Um, but there are further ways to deal with that case too. Cool. All right, let's 
let's get to the part where we actually get our accuracies, which is the, the biggest technical challenge here. All right, so these graphical models that we were talking about, you know, they're not really critical for understanding what's happening here. It's just sort of a, a convenient representation that tells you some information about these distributions by looking at this graph. So in this graphical model, there's a node for every random variable. The edges tell you something about correlations or covariances. Um, there's a real technical explanation for what exactly they mean, but very roughly, if there's an edge between things, you can think of them as correlated. If there's no edge between a pair of nodes, you can think of them as having some type of independence between them. Sometimes you have to do something to the variables to get out that independence, but that's the basic idea. So in this setup, the labeling functions are always connected to the true label. If they were not, then there'd be no relationship between the labeling function value and the label, right? You would have a, a random guessing kind of labeling function, which would not be useful. So we always have these edges between the actual value of the label and all the labeling functions. Now, sometimes we have edges between pairs of labeling functions, and sometimes we don't. When we have that pair is the case of correlations, right? That was in our whole jury setup when you have you know, two of the witnesses talking to each other and coming up with a story. So that's something we also want to model because we do want to downweight you know, those values. And in fact, implicitly, when you compute this conditional P of Y given stuff um, probability, you're actually going to take that into account when you compute it. Okay, so here is the sort of first and maybe easiest method for learning the parameters. The only real parameter we care to know about is these accuracies, right? That's the one that's hard. Everything else we can kind of do. So I'm going to exploit independence specifically. And that's why this graphical model on the left, there's no edges between the labeling functions, only between LFs and the true label. And again, remember what these accuracy parameters are. There are these expectations of the product of a labeling function and why. And sort of the bigger these are, the more reliable you can think of a labeling function. If they're perfectly reliable, you know, I would just use that information for why. If they're super unreliable, we want to downweight them. So let's, let's look at this really neat property of independence. The labeling functions themselves are not independent of each other, which is good, right? Because they're all trying to predict the same thing. If they were independent, you know, they'd have to be terrible. Um, but it turns out that the products of the labeling functions and why, these things often are independent. Um, essentially, the accuracies are independent, even though the variables themselves are not independent. Okay, so what does that mean? So if I write this product on the left, this lambda 1y, lambda 2y, I can factorize this product because of independence as the product of two expectations. So it's expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. Okay, so that's one trick. Now there's a second trick. This y was plus one or minus one. Those are the two possible values, right? So when I just multiply lambda 1y, lambda 2y, I get lambda 1, lambda 2y squared. But y squared is 1, regardless of whether y is plus or minus 1. So this 1 just goes away, right? I end up just seeing lambda 1, lambda 2's expectation here. OK, so this is neat. We're writing the expectation of lambda 1y times lambda 2y, which are these two accuracy parameters. Their product is this correlation parameter that I can actually estimate, right? This thing is just the agreement or disagreement on average of a pair of labeling functions, right? So if I go and look at all the things they've labeled, I can say, oh yeah, they have the same label, you know, 75% of the time and they're different 25% of the time. And that tells me this, this expectation of lambda one, lambda two. In other words, this is observable, right? That, that's the key thing here. So I don't really know what the accuracy parameters are for these two labeling functions, but I do know that they multiply to be this kind of correlation parameter that I actually know. So this is really nice. We don't know the accuracy parameters, but we know a function of the accuracy parameters, which is their product, right? Okay, so this is actually kind of the, the key thing that we have to have here. Once we have this, we can do a little system of equations. 
we can write down this exact thing for three labeling functions, just going two at a time. So these three equations, I just did this exact trick for lambda one, lambda two, then for lambda one, lambda three, then for lambda two, lambda three. Again, same idea. We have this independence property between each of these pairs. There's three different pairs. And the cool thing now is basically that I have three equations and I have three variables. What are the three variables? They're just each of these accuracy parameters. And you know, I know the left-hand sides for all these cases, right? So you can think of this as like A times B has some value, A times C has some value, B times C has some value. I know those three values and I need to compute A, B, and C from them. Okay, we can solve this. That's a nice part. How did I do this little solution? Take the first two equations and you multiply them, right? Both of them will have this expectation of lambda one y. So there's a square there. And then I get times this guy times that guy. Then I divide by the third equation, which contains those two terms as well, and they cancel out. So the only thing I'll have left is this expectation squared. And then I take a square root. Okay, so very you know algebra two level solution here, but it's really good, right? The accuracy parameter we were looking for, this one, is just equal to the square root of this expression that involves three of the correlation parameters that we can actually get, right? So even though we never got the CY, and even though we can't directly you know do a sample average to get this expectation. We've written it in terms of stuff that is observable. So we can go ahead in our label matrix and just compute these three terms, solve this little equation here, and get our guess of this product. And then I can do this you know, for every possible labeling function, right? And I'll get all of the accuracies. Correlation I can estimate directly, right? I just do that sample average over all of them, just like the coin flips. So this slide kind of completes this process. Now we have access to all the accuracies and we're kind of pretty much done. So let's recap this thing. The approach is take all the labeling functions, split them up into sets of three, estimate these agreement and disagreement rates that you need, and then go ahead and solve the system for every single triplet. And then once you do this, you, know, you have all of the parameters that you have. And this is actually what happens in one of the label model implementations. There's this fit method. It literally does this computation where it gets the accuracies and the correlations. And once those are known, there's a method that just does the inference step, which is this P of Y given lambda one for lambda M, this actual probabilistic um, data thing that we want to get in the end. So this is basically a full end to end, how does the label model do what we needed to do kind of explanation. It's not the default one, but it is one of the variants that we have implemented in there. Um, and it's, it's really simple, right? I mean, we didn't really do anything here except compute one really simple formula to get all of the accuracy parameters, and then we're done. Let's stop for a minute just so we can answer some questions, and then I'll tell you some downsides of doing it this way. Uh, one question is, if you take all the triplets, won't you have multiple estimates for each E, e lambda one Y? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is something that will happen. You can either be, you know, you can just divide this into three labeling functions at a time, and you'll get each of the accuracy parameters for each of those three within its own system. That's one way to do it. Or you can compute multiple estimates of each accuracy and then do something like take the median, which will make you robust in noise. Because that is a downside, right? Like if any of these kinds of correlations are estimated poorly because you don't have that many samples or because you got unlucky, there'll be a lot of noise there, right? You'll be off from the true parameter by quite a lot. Um, and that'll affect your estimate, especially the dividing one here, right? When you divide by stuff, if you're off by a little bit, you can blow stuff up easily. Well, that's nice. So like by including more triplets, you can get a more robust estimate. Exactly. That's cool. In fact, you, you do have to do this. Uh, it can can be pretty noisy if you got a really bad sampling into triplets. So with I, this, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so with this knowledge, Fred, like how is there more concrete feedback we can give to folks about how to compose the labeling functions? 
like we allow like folks for example to like very quickly and easily like create sort of a list of terms and if that if the you know the candidate for ie for example like falls into one of those lists then like you know that you vote positive or, or negative or what have you and sometimes that can be quite arbitrary about how we construct those lists of terms like how would you now take with a better understanding of the label model what kind of sort of feedback would we want to like provide our users about how to compose lfs like to take full advantage of how accuracies and correlations are computed yeah that's that's an awesome question so i mean i think right now what we do is very quickly run the labeling functions on a dev set and say hey how accurate are you but the nice thing is you could actually very quickly compute these kinds of accuracy parameters without even needing a dev set and then you can tell the user, yeah, I think you have a really bad labeling function, right? Your accuracy is close to zero. Iterate, get some more information, see how much better you do. There's probably way more sophisticated stuff you can do as well, especially for cases where you're doing this for multi-class situations, where you could then specify like your labeling function. Well, I guess our labeling functions are currently anyway not going to do this, but for labeling functions that can vote multiple things, right? They're multipolar. You could say, oh yeah, specifically for some particular class, your estimate is really bad. You should change it there um, and stuff like that. So yeah, there's, there's probably tons of feedback we can give based on this. And the good thing about this particular label model is that it's very fast. So you can run it in real time and you can immediately give that feedback. You don't have to wait for it to run or anything else. Uh, yeah, I guess I was thinking more like in that the contrived example I gave, like when would we, when would we expect the user or tell the user, hey, like these terms, you should split them apart into separate LFs or that you should combine them together. Like that's kind of the thing that seems somewhat arbitrary. Gotcha. Like, you don't give any feedback about. But, and, you know, I don't even really know, have a good intuition for how to construct that. Like, yeah. yes, I'll yeah, put semantically similar information together, but like maybe there's a more prudent way of doing that. That, that is really neat, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the one thing you would think here is that if you have an automated way of splitting up your labeling function, right, you could basically very quickly run the composed labeling function versus its constituent parts, right? And then you could say, okay, which ones are more accurate, which ones are less accurate, and will the composed version be better than just including all the separate parts? And we could do that fairly quickly as well. I've never thought about this, so this is pretty neat. Yeah, maybe we should chat about this at some point. I can think of several things we could try here. I don't have like a good answer though to the question of like, what is the intuition behind when you'd like to stuff together more labeling function concepts into one variable versus keeping them separate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a chat. Um, my question is, what's the best way to describe how a label model is trained in a plain English? So you started from court case, and then uh, this is a mathematical formula, and I was able to follow those mathematical like um, um, equation and stuff like that. But one way, for example, how would you go back to that analogy? Yeah. Uh, like court case. You know? That's a great question, yeah. So basically what you're saying here is you're gonna look at the way that different witnesses are voting together or not voting together. In this case, your witnesses are all going to make predictions about like a thousand trials, right? So it's not just for a single trial at a time. And you're going to gauge how often they agree with each other and how often they disagree with each other. And you're going to be able to, from that, gain information about which one is more likely to be right and which one's less likely to be right, right? So you're learning how accurate each of these witnesses are over the course of many trials, but without ever knowing the true verdict of the trial. Okay, but okay, so it kind of breaks down. It's not a perfect analogy anymore. Okay, got it. Like uh, looking at probably one of the one of the implementation, like a, a invariance, an inverse covariance matrix. What does that go back to the court case? That was what something I have been wondering for many, 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 many we're, uh, years. We're coming to it next. So okay, cool. Just one second, and we'll be there. Actually, I think it's the next slide. So yeah. Yeah, these are great questions. All right, let's also note the biggest downside of what we just did here, right? This little canceling trick of multiplying, you know, y with itself, which is where we actually started, right? Here we said that y times y is y squared, which is always one, 
that is not true anymore. If you have y, that could be you know more than plus or minus one, right? If it's zero, one, two, three, four, then you don't have this kind of equation any longer. So that is an annoying downside, right? This label model is very good for binary and not as good for higher cardinality cases. Now we'll talk about the sort of the most general version, which is this inverse covariance thing um, that we were referring to just now. Okay, so this is like the second kind of approach. Uh, and Vince, let me know if I'm out of time, by the way. Uh, we're, we're close to the official time, but I personally, and others are welcome to stay, and if you have time, I'm happy to go over a little bit, but if people need to hop to, no worries, this is recorded, so we can uh, show this afterwards, so. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, so this is the second approach, which is a bit more general. It can handle a lot more stuff. It's also more computationally difficult, but yeah. And it's also the default thing that we actually do in the code currently. So basically, so far we've talked about how you know, all of these kinds of accuracy and correlation parameters are these covariances. And the nice thing is you can put all the covariances into a matrix, right? Because you're computing the covariance of every node, with every other node. And that's this overall matrix here. And this green stuff is the correlations, which are the things, of course, I can directly estimate. And the stuff in red are, again, the accuracies that I can't directly tell. So nothing new here, just sort of a, a new data structure for it, if you like. OK. Now, there's something magical that happens when you take the inverse of this covariance matrix. And what's going on if we take the inverse? Basically, in the inverse, it has something to do with the graph. Entries are 0 if there is no edge in the graph that we had. So remember, not having edges in the graph was the sort of independence kind of thing. And that turns out to reflect itself in the inverse covariance matrix. It's a very deep sort of stats property. Now, of course, I can't compute the full inverse directly because I don't know the red stuff, right? So, you know, I can't just like form a big matrix and then run NumPy inverse on it, at least not yet. I do know the full green part though, right? And I can invert that. But inverting the green part by itself does not give me the blue part, you know, sorry, this yellow part of the inverse. Right, like if you take a sub matrix and invert it, it's not the same thing as that part of the full inverse matrix, but it's close to it. It satisfies this matrix equation. So this looks confusing, but it's not anything super crazy. All we're saying here is that if I take this yellow square of the inverse matrix, that's the left hand side here, it is the same thing as inverting this green known part of the forward matrix, just inverting it by itself plus one term that has to do with this red stuff here. So one more time, I care about this covariance matrix inverse because it has some special structure information. There are entries that are zero if we have this no edge between them in the graph. And I can also write down what this particular yellow component of the inverse matrix looks like. It's this left-hand term, and I can express it as something that I know how to compute plus some stuff that contains the parameters we care about. So now I've encoded all the information I care to solve into this matrix equation. Sigma inverse O, which is the observed part, and is equal to sigma O inverse plus some stuff that involves the actual accuracy parameters. OK, so that was high level, but we can show the actual sort of details there. Let's say this is the graph. Um, we have you know labeling functions that are sometimes independent, sometimes not, right? There's some triangles here. There's some pairs. There's a singleton, which is this L of eight here. We're going to use this information because of this whole zeros in the inverse covariance matrix. All right, so let's let's draw it out. Here is the inverse covariance matrix, this left-hand side thing. Here's what it actually looks like. These colors are the intensities of the values. Black means zero. So why are there these black parts off the diagonal? Well, it's precisely because there's no edges between labeling functions, right? So basically what's going on here is that this pair of labeling functions are connected. That's what's going on in this upper triangle here. Then the rest of the row is zero because these pair of labeling functions are not connected to anything else. Same thing with this next part here. There's a triplet, right? They're connected to each other. So there's yellow entries, which means there's some values there. They're not zero. 
But then when you look at their connections to anything else in this covariance matrix, there's nothing else, right? They're all zero. And same thing with this pair, and then same thing with the last LFA by itself. Okay, so let's kind of write down the full thing. We have this, this left-hand side, which is this inverse covariance matrix. We don't know it, but we know where it's black because we know the graph. And then we have this observable thing that we can compute, this green term. And then finally, we have this yellow thing here that actually contains the information we care about. So we have this kind of matrix equation set up now. We know the green thing fully. We know where the, the left-hand blue thing is zero. We want to know the right-hand thing. Normally, this would not be enough to solve, but the fact that the right-hand thing is actually a rank one matrix is enough. It only has m, not m squared parameters. OK, so you can decompose this thing into a bunch of equations instead of having matrices. And basically, you say, OK, I have these parameters I need to solve for. I have a bunch of equations ij where I know there's a 0, which is the left-hand side. And then this gives me a linear system that I can solve. So this was kind of a lot of math, but basically all we did here is say I can resolve all of my accuracy parameters by solving a big matrix equation as long as there's enough sparsity in this graph. And this is really what we actually do in, in practice. And it turns out in simple cases, I don't even need to invert the covariance matrix, but you know, it's not an important detail. This can be done for high cardinality. Right? You don't have to do it for binary. Um, and it also even works for data that's you know, continuous. In fact, it works for a lot of stuff in general. That's a fairly general approach. But it is more complicated. right? To solve these equations, I'm using kind of all of the information that I have access to. OK, so once you do this, you have the full green matrix, which is the entire covariance with all of the accuracy parameters. And the nice thing is you can also prove that this actually works under certain conditions in practice. And one more thing, if you don't know the dependency structure, so you don't know who's coordinating, there is a yet further way of learning it that you would do using this tool called Robust PCA that can decompose a matrix into the sum of a sparse and low rank matrix. I'm not going to talk about the details about this thing. Um, it's also incredibly finicky, but we do have this implemented as well. And one of the more advanced label models will use this kind of information that comes from it. I'll stop there just because we're also over time. Um, if you folks have more questions, I'll be happy to answer them too. Let me go back to the uh, matrix equation from earlier. Hey, can you say a little bit more about the low rank assumption and, and how we come to that? Yeah. Yeah. So really where this equation comes from is from just a property of inverting block matrices. Right. So suppose you have a block matrix, which means it has like an A, a B, a C, a D. Right. Then you want to be able to express the inverse of this big block matrix as a function of the inverses of each of the blocks, right? Like, suppose you knew A inverse, B inverse, C inverse, D inverse. Now, what would be lovely is, of course, if I could say that A, B, C, D all inverse is just A inverse, B inverse, C inverse, D inverse, but it's not unless the diagonal blocks are, I mean, I saw you, unless you have zeros off the diagonal. So in general, this is not true. But there is an actual formula that tells you how to manipulate all the block inverses to get the full inverse. And this equation comes from that. It basically says, OK, I have this component of the inverse. It's the same thing as inverting that component by itself, plus a certain term. And here, the reason it's low rank is because each of these things are just like a row that involves the accuracy parameters. Yeah, it's low rank because the accuracies only consist of a single row, which is the covariances between a labeling function and y. In fact, it's rank one exactly. But only if it's a binary classification problem. If it's a k class classification problem, it becomes rank k minus one, which is still low compared to the labeling function part fully. Okay, that was a lot of algebra, but basically it's not a hard thing, it's just a properties of matrices and matrix inversions kind of thing. Thank you, that, that's helpful. Yeah, if you didn't have a low rank thing, you could not do it. Um, you wouldn't have enough information to solve in general. 
Um, sorry, I'm not super technical, so it might be a dumb question, but we need the, the most sparse the matrix is, uh, the better the model, right? Does it ever right. become a compute challenge when because sparse matrices are, I, I suppose, more difficult to uh, compute? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. So so in this case, I mean, sparse really refers to the fact that there's not too many dependencies, right? Um, the matrices itself are always not that big because the number of entries is the number of labeling functions times the number of labeling functions you know, plus one. So you're never going to have like thousands of labeling functions. Even if you did, it still wouldn't be that huge. If you were at the point of like tens of thousands of labeling functions or more, then this would actually get like computationally too hard to do things like invert. But that's actually never really a problem for our cases. What the sparsity will really impact here basically is like, if it's a really sparse thing, which means all the labeling functions are really independent, then you'll have many, many, many equations to solve as an outcome. So you'll have a really big linear system downstream. It's still not that bad though. Like it can be done fairly efficiently. Um, the real problem is a lack of sparsity. If you have a very dense matrix, which means that you don't have very many independencies, um, then you might not have enough information to solve. Basically, if there's not enough black parts in this left matrix, then you don't get enough information to get the red part from the green. So you really want more and more sparsity, ideally. If it's completely dense, you actually can't solve at all. Thanks. Um, so this also might be a dumb question, but uh, if we have good labeling functions, wouldn't they be correlated to each other more than bad labeling functions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So first of all, theoretically, no. Um, all of the labeling functions are correlated if you don't like condition on Y. So basically like if you ignore the fact that they're all labeling Y, yes, they're extremely correlated no matter what. When you do this trick of either conditioning on Y or multiplying by Y, which is this expectation of lambda one Y, you're really talking about whether their accuracies or their noise is correlated versus not. You can actually have fairly uncorrelated random variables that are still both very, very accurate if they use different information to make their guesses. Now, okay, there are problems where that's not even possible. You know, everybody's using the same exact information and is therefore pretty correlated, right? But there are cases where you could like approach the true label from very different directions, from very different features or different information. And then you could be really accurate, but still uncorrelated which is ideal, that's our best possible case. You know, what's happening in practice? Yeah, of course the labeling functions are actually correlated in practice. You're absolutely right, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. But yes, it's also true. I mean, the more inaccurate you are, probably the less correlated you tend to be just by nature of that. Um, but it is theoretically at least possible to be very accurate and still uncorrelated in this yeah. super ideal setting. Thank you. Uh, quick question. The last piece you, you described a advanced label model. Are we using this advanced label model in a circle flow? Is it just one of your um, home, home drive or? It, so there is some setting that turns on advanced label models, which lets you run all of the variations. Um, and then basically all of them get into the tuner. So it'll pick out the best one on some dev set. Um, so yeah, once that setting is enabled, then it'll run all of these things, including the thing over a bus PCA at the end and a bunch of other variations, the triplets, many, many different things. On local flow. Yep. Cool. Um, one, one question that clients um, sometimes ask is how many labeling functions they need. Obviously it depends on the case, right? Is it possible as they write labeling functions that we try to determine, calculate whether the, the functions are sufficiently independent and whether, yes. uh, you know, can we kind of ask to say, hey, you need five more and they, probably not five more, you have to specify both independence and also the number, but is it possible to surface that kind of suggestion as they go? Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's a great suggestion. And we kind of have the machinery to do that, right? So like the, the place where you're gonna struggle the most is, First of all, if you don't have many overlaps between the labeling functions, then your estimate of the overlap rate overall will be bad, right? So imagine of instead of flipping 10,000 coins to get your mean, you flip six coins, right? That's not very accurate when you estimate that kind of thing. 
So that's exactly the kind of information that you should provide the users. Like, hey, currently you have very few overlaps, get more overlaps for these labeling functions. And I believe we actually do do that. Um, there is in one of the analysis pages, you can actually see that information, but we could give even more like fine grained information on that. So yes, this would be a place that's very useful to do that. We could tell them how many additional labeling functions we think would be handy to have, assuming that we could make them sufficiently independent. The hard part is that we don't have a very good control of how dependent these are, right? The ideal thing is to always give yourself more independent labeling functions, but it's very tricky to guarantee that they really will be independent or not. So by the way, this, this whole thing will theoretically work with exactly three conditionally independent labeling functions, right? But the reality is that you won't be able to guarantee that in practice. So adding more of them is actually better ultimately. Got it. It is it might, might be a dumb question, but um, sometimes we would like to have labeling functions be more correlated, right? Oh, so, sorry. Uh, we wanna we wanna be able to. Oh, sorry, it's not the right. The phrasing is we wanna we we need to observe the uh, the correlation between the labeling functions better. Uh, so we assume that we have a set of certain set of ground truth. But is it possible to say, you know, take those two labeling functions? Can you find a ground truth label or like a, can you find a data point that you know might provide some insight into a correlation of the accuracies of the the labeling functions? Is that something? you know, we can potentially do as well. Yeah, so I mean, this is similar to what we were talking about before, which is just, well, basically you want them to make sure that they don't abstain too often together, right? So it's really rough if one labeling function abstains on every point the other labeling function is voting on, right? Because then you have no signal at all about when they agree and when they disagree. So that's the kind of thing that's worth keeping track of. And if you don't, include that information, your ultimate accuracy estimation will be pretty bad as well. Now, okay, if you do have a dev set, you have ground truth for whatever the situation may be, you can kind of estimate some of these accuracies directly, right? Like you can actually look at lambda i times y and take the average of those guys, and that will produce a good direct estimate, um, which is Brandon was mentioning this earlier. And that's sort of an alternative label model. Everything we've talked about so far assumes you have no ground truth no dev set, nothing whatsoever, which is sort of the original, I don't know, specification that we had for weak supervision. But once you add more information, you can do all kinds of other nicer things. So, I mean, um, uh, uh, so right now we asked users to provide labeling functions, but can we also do the inverse and say, hey, given the labeling functions, can you think of examples that could, you know, break the case where one labeling function is providing signal and others abstaining? Yeah, no, that, I think that's a nice idea. Like, I don't know the mathematical specification for that, but I like the concept. But no, I haven't thought about doing that before. Got it, thanks. Awesome. Well, we're uh, we're fifteen minutes over now, which feels like a good uh, <laughs> late lateness stopping point. But um, thank you so much, Fred. This was extraordinarily uh, clear, and and I think the team really appreciated it. So. Um, yeah, we'll we'll send any follow up questions, and you know, we know you're on Slack, so yeah, yeah sorry I'm, to, I'm not to like checking. I'm not an external person on yeah, yeah, yeah. Slack, so <laughs> just you know, ask me questions, whatever. I'm happy to chat about this. Yeah, but thanks yeah. a lot for giving me the chance. I always have fun talking about label model stuff. It's a long term passion right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it sounds like a lot of also just concrete uh, brainstorms or kind of projects that could potentially come out of this. So yeah, super excited. Awesome. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Fred. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll catch up uh, soon. Thanks, everyone. This was really nice. Fred. Thank you, Fred. Bye. Thanks, folks.